the biggest deal of its kind in history. This is an unbelievable opportunity for conservation and for Chile. They didn't tell me about that long ramp. I would have done a different shoe today. All right, welcome back, welcome back. So some new faces here. Welcome to Hub Week. Uh, my name is Kathleen Kennedy. I am one of the co-founders and on the board of Hub Week. I'm really thrilled that you're here to celebrate Hub Week's fifth anniversary with us. Uh, let's see, so who's new to Hub Week? Raise your hand, awesome. Welcome to the community. This is a really great community, you're gonna love it. Hub Week was founded in 2014 by the Boston Globe, Harvard, MIT, and the Mass General Hospital. And we're all about celebrating the really cool innovations that are happening at the intersection of art, science, and technology. Um, I want to introduce two fantastic people that you're gonna hear from now. Uh, first is Linda Henry who is also one of the co-founders of Hub Week and the managing director of the Boston Globe. And she is going to interview Chris Tompkins. And Chris is the co-founder and president of Thompson's Conservation, Tompkins Conservation, for conservation and rethinking the planet's future. We were just back there talking about how critical climate change is that we need to address it. She's dedicated her life to protecting our planet, both as an entrepreneur and a conservationist. Um, Linda will tease out a lot of really great stories for you, so let's hear it for Chris and Linda. Hello, everybody. I'm Chris. <laughs> uh, if I can figure this out. There we go, Tompkins Conservation. Um, I thought I would give you a little background information on us, since some of you may know a little bit about us, some of you nothing, and maybe just a few a whole lot. Tompkins Conservation is an entity that my husband Douglas and I formed in 1993. And um, I thought I would give you a little background on us and why would we become involved in land and sea conservation over the last 25 years. And as you can see by this photograph, we had what probably by any standard was a very wild life very early on. And we're also a product of the 60s and have some friends here and partners in our projects here in the front row who also understood very well what it meant to grow up in the civil rights movement, Vietnam and the peace movement, the feminist movement, and uh, that really instilled an ethos in us that remains today. My husband was the founder of the North Face, sold that, started a spree company, which was the fashion label and with my boss, Yvonne Chouinard, we started Patagonia Company in 1973. And I bring this up because what we're doing today is very much related to the very companies that we designed and built. They're activists. We were thinking that all bankers were evil and business was a wrap and we really created companies that we would want to work for. So I'm very fortunate and gratified by saying that most of our lives have followed a certain kind of value system that has, has uh, a lot of wealth in the sense of not that many people get to do and live lives like that, so I feel very grateful. This is uh, the Fitzroy trip, 1968. My husband and best friend, Yvonne Chouinard, drove for six months to go down and climb. 
the emblematic peak in Argentina in Fitzroy. I, I bring this up because what we're going to talk about today is where we ended up going after we finished our business life. And when Doug and Yvonne and two other guys actually put the third route, route up on Fitzroy and came back down and eventually ended up in California again, they never forgot the Southern Cone. And in 1992, <clears throat> or 1990, Doug and I met again in some one-dog town in the south of Argentina, fell in love immediately. I came back and decided that I would retire, having been CEO of, of Patagonia, and he had sold his half of his brie back to his former wife, Susie. And off we went, um, forming this foundation. It is based on the same five pillars we've had since the very beginning, the conservation of land and sea. We're going to talk about these things, so I don't want to go into this very deeply. Um, you can see somebody who's not being conserved on the marine side. It's about to end its life. Number two, the restoration of landscapes. And this year, actually, the restoration of seascapes as well. And rewilding. This is a new part of our work, new last 15 years, which has become probably the biggest, certainly most complex and long-term project that we have running, bringing back uh, jaguars. Uh, anything in any of our 12 national parks, nearly 15 million acres of land that is missing, we go after them and bring them back. Regenerative agriculture, I think a lot of you probably know a lot about this. I'm not going to get into it so much today. Um, activism, as I said earlier, activism is one of the core pillars of our personal lives since we were young, and that remains today essentially the same thing. And community engagement where we have parklands if you don't have local uh, buy-in from local communities, if they don't benefit from these parks, then you can't imagine that 100 to 200 years from now, they're going to be well protected. And we can talk about that in a minute. So off we went, 1993, to a roadless area in southern Chile. This is where we were based. And that's how we got started, which today is Pumalin Douglas Tompkins National Park, just over a million acres created uh, this year. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, over the years, we have created extraordinary teams in Argentina and Chile, the only territories we've chosen to work in. And I'm going to leave this map up here. As of January of this year, these are the national parks that we've created. And as I said a few minutes ago, where there's a national park, if, if someone is missing, we go back in and we're working on rewilding in all of these areas. So I'm going to leave it here, sit down, and have a chat. <laughs> Thank you. Chris, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for that overview because, oh, somebody changed it. Um, because it's incredibly helpful just for the overall perspective of what you're doing. And there's so much to unpack here. But I actually want to start a little bit with your personal journey, um, which you started in California. And you talked about how you grew up on your great-grandfather's ranch and how that you just lived a time um, which wasn't as common for women, but a very outdoorsy life. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think, um, as you said, I grew, we grew up on our great-grandfather's great ranch, and we're outside, we were on horses all the time, and I think that... I don't think we understood it as such at the time, but looking back, 
you see how your values and the things that you're interested in are formed, or some of the, a lot of the things that you end up rejecting. But that certainly was one of the one of the key parts of my background. And when you um, you started working with what became Patagonia while you were still in school, you would work summers. You went to college in Idaho, and you'd, summers you would spend working at this early outdoor company that didn't have its own clothing, but it had its own, it sort of catered to people like you who really appreciated being active. Well, it was um, Yvonne's company called Chouinard Equipment, and we made technical rock and ice climbing equipment. My, when I came home from my freshman year at college, my mother sat me down and said, uh, look, I know this is going to come as a shock to you, but you have to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> I am not your personal banker. Oh. So I went to Yvonne and was complaining about this fate of mine. And he said, come work for me for $2 an hour. And I thought that was a gold mine. And I did for every summer. And then when I graduated from college, mm. had no idea what I was going to do. And in my family, you get cut off the minute you receive your, de your degree. And so I started working for him full time again. And then a couple years after that, he thought he, we should start making clothing for ourselves. And that's how we started Patagonia. And so you were there, you were from the very beginning, you saw this, this company form. And, and as you mentioned in your, um, in your intro, this company was very much created as an anti-company and with the ethos of, of what you believed in, which is living the wildlife and um, sort of uh, uh, being good people instead of a bad corporation. Well, I don't want to overstate this too much, really. But I will say that because Yvonne really never cared about the size of the business. He really wanted the company he wanted. And that sets a framework mm. for creating something in the image that you hold or that you aspire to. And those circumstances are very rare. Mm. Very rare. So. I was at a board meeting a month ago, and if I close my eyes, I can, as he's speaking, I can hear him having a similar conversation 45 years ago. So uh, we just had from the beginning, which was really the guidance of Melinda and Yvonne, Melinda being his wife and my oldest friend, there, there was a culture around all of us that was very conservative fiscally, mm -hmm. but not conservative at all on the social side. And so at what point, at what size was it when you realized that you, really, that you were CEO, or you were told you were CEO? Oh, I don't know. I don't remember. Small. It was still small. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I was probably 28 years old, wow. something like that. And you wrote it all the you you grew the company from when you from yeah you were telling a story about you know ripping off labels on carabiners and and yeah, that was my best job <laughs> um, to becoming CEO of that of a company that was just really growing rapidly that it had really identified and resonated with clients customers. Yeah, it, you know, again, I feel like I had uh, the chance of a lifetime. I've never had an interview. My CV would be one line long. <laughs> you know, it's like they read on tombstones. There's the year you were born and the year you died, but in the dash between lies a lifetime. And that's sort of how my life <laughs> was at Patagonia. Uh, and then when I reached my 40th birthday, I began to panic. Mm -hmm. 
thinking, I could be doing this when I'm 50 or I'm 60, maybe even 70. And, and I really wanted to do something else, but I didn't know what. And then Doug and I re-met down in Argentina and, and, you know, things kind of unfold organically in a way. And so you, <laughs> you took a, you, you left the, your job as CEO and you decided that you, you know, that was not the only thing. You were going to rewrite your, or continue the narrative on your legacy when you're saying you're only going to be one thing. And you've really found your, a way to effectively live your values by focusing on conservation. Yeah, I would say continue to live our values. I don't, I don't think we had to jumpstart them. But these, this idea of going to the Southern Cone and starting to buy it up large tracts of land was Doug's idea. Mm -hmm. He'd already um, bought one particular piece of land and even, and, even, and at that point, even he didn't understand where all this was going to go. It's not as though we had this massive plan and that we would end up with these kinds of territories and doing what we did. But like all things, you kind of try it out. If it works, you go a little farther, try it out. And then we just, in the f after four years or so, we started really expanding fairly quickly. Um, and so, what was the, which was the first of the tracks that you really assembled that was a substantial size? Pumaline, uh, what is today Pumaline Douglas Tompkins National Park. And that's really the experience that we cut our teeth on and Chile cut its teeth on us. It was quite controversial at the time. There were extraordinary things said about us. <clears throat> because this territory, even in the early years, was probably half a million acres. And it went from the border to Argentina to the Pacific Ocean. So we were called the couple who cut Chile in half. Mm. We were accused of creating a new Jewish state, even though we were raised as Anglicans, um, that, that it was a nuclear waste site for the United States, that we were going to take out all the cattle of southern Chile and replace it with American bison, and all sorts of things were said about us. Uh, our phones were tapped for five years or more. Um, planes from the military flying low over uh, the areas where we were based. So it was... Um, Noteworthy, although that was 26, 25 years ago. So you always have to put those things in context. Today, I completely understand why it happened, but at the time, it was a little unsettling. That you were trying to do something that you felt was the right thing to do, and you were just met with this fear. Yeah, I just didn't have... And neither, uh, Doug nor I had experience with creating conservation areas, we sort of did it backwards. We went out and started creating them and then read the history book so about the fights in North America over the creation of Grand Teton National Park, which was took 60 years. So I didn't understand that wherever there's conservation, there's going to be a conflict. So uh, we sort of got going and hadn't really prepared ourselves, I think, for the onslaught that would follow. Can you explain why national, why parks like this are natural climate change solutions? Well, in a very direct sense. Most conservation areas, even the ones that are pretty beat up and in the process of being restored, are more, they sequester more carbon than those areas that have been tremendously degraded. Um, I am working with Nat Geo on some things and ask them to help us really calculate the carbon impact that all of our parks have had. <clears throat> this is just in the last six months. And I was astonished by the figures. 
I never actually thought about it so directly in the past. I, if, you, if you look in, in terms of climate change very directly, it's a given that, first of all, different ecosystems can sequester carbon at different rates. But regardless of that, any time that you take territory, whether it's forest or, or, or it's grasslands and you wetlands and you park it to the side, you are going to have a net positive effect on the general climate instability. Uh, I guess that's all I would say other than when you think about rewilding, and that's what I was saying a little bit about earlier. At first, there were scientists saying that complete wildlife systems protect or, or fight against carbon pollution. And I kept thinking, I don't believe that. What is that? But of course, it's true. If everybody's there and everybody is functioning, it means that the system is functioning. Therefore, it's likely that it's sequestering more carbon than those, as I said earlier, um, that are quite degraded. I think it's always important when you ask about the value of something, and in this case, conservation, it's helpful for me to look at anything in its absence. Where would we be in the absence of any conservation? If you took all the national parks out of the United States and all the, all the monuments, which Trump's trying to do, actually, so it's not so far off, and then look at the earth without the conservation that's taken place today, then you really understand their value. And if you look at the African continent, where 95% of the territory is under some form of production, those areas that are reserves, that are national parks, become even ever so more important. Um, one of the reasons why, you know, not only are, are you greatly admired for just the sheer volume that you've been able to, to um, create for national parks, but the really thoughtful approach that you have for the long-term success of these national parks, uh, which you, you highlighted your five pillars. And I want to I want to dig into into some of them because I think that it's a it's a really important thing and there are, there are takeaways that that um, we can have for other projects um, in, in terms of them being long lasting and effective. And one is that you wanted these parks to be open to people. And which is a very, you know, you didn't just close it off and say, this is, this is for the Jaguars. This is yeah. a place where we want people to explore, which just really fits with your life. Oh, definitely. I think in many ways, and I think some of our partners sitting here in the front row would agree that national parks specifically are quite a democratic move. They belong to everyone. If you... If you buy a Picasso and you hang it in your living room, your friends will see it, your, maybe some of your lucky neighbors and your family members. But if you take that same Picasso and you hang it at the Met or wherever you put it, millions of people will see that work of art every year and learn from it. They like it, they don't like it, but it's, it creates part of the national, and I would say when it comes to these things, international psyche that when I walk through the gates of Yellowstone National Park, I'm thinking, that's my park. Keep your mitts off my park. And this is a very, very American idea, as Ken Burns said. This is America's best idea, is the feeling, and you can see it in Chile, that as I mentioned 25 years ago, we were really creamed by Chilean society, and today that has changed utterly. The Chileans are starting to take 
their point of pride and defending their national parks, and that's 25 years, that's one generation. So it's amazing. No, it, it makes a huge difference to, to, to create these places with infrastructure so everybody can visit and have those experiences. And that's a way of having more people want to preserve it going forward. That's a, exactly. again, it was a very it was a brilliant long-term uh, preservation strategy to, to have more people feel ownership um, of, of the parks that you're creating. Um, you talked about the, the restoration of these lands, um, and that's bringing back it to as close as you can to its sort of native state. Talk about that, how difficult that process is. Well, it, certainly it depends on the territory. We have uh, <clears throat> in the Patagonia National Park down in the south of the 800,000 acres of that new national park as of this year, probably 45% of that is Patagonia steppe grasslands. And by and large, the only thing you do there is get the livestock off and, and then hope to God it begins to heal itself. Mm. Not all of it will, but some of it will. In almost all of the really large scale projects we have in the wetlands, two million acres of one uh, watershed, wetland watershed, you really have to work more on rewilding from jaguars all the way through the trophic cascade line of anteaters, peccaries, the whole... You need spot. the full circle of life. You need the top of the chain down to the bottom yes. for, for the system to thrive again? That's right. So, I mean, I think probably most people in here know this, but to have a fully functioning ecosystem, everybody's got to be there or certainly top predators and, and all the significant species, not that they're not all significant, <laughs> need to be there for the system to function. It's like somebody said that um, landscape without wildlife is just scenery, and that's true. So you never, I never look at a territory the same way that I might have 30 years ago because I can't help myself. I have to know who's missing, who are the obvious ones and who are the less obvious ones. Um, and you, you showed us a really beautiful image of regenerative agriculture. And you said, if you don't get agriculture right, you can kiss off the rest since it is the greatest use of our land. What, is, what does regenerative agriculture mean? It's really, excuse me, regenerative ag is, is, is the better cousin of what we call organic agriculture today because or, organic agriculture has been co-opted by an industrial method of growing food. And that's really not the idea. The idea is, in terms of regenerative is that you are improving your... The, your soil every year, the sequestration of carbon is improving every year, and that it's it's very it's been really hard to get this concept through in a wide way because it took so long just to get organic agriculture on the books and and accepted and so on. So this is a step beyond just organic. Um, and you're doing this within Chile, around the national parks? No, that farm that you saw very briefly is one of our family farms. And all the farms have been um, promoted by Doug and me personally. This wasn't part of the foundation. Um, we have all sorts of projects, either ours or somebody else's, who are, who are really trying to crack this egg called agriculture. Because, and that quote comes from Doug, that if you don't get ag right, you can forget the rest. Because agriculture and livestock 
take up the vast majority of what soil or space that humans have under production. Uh, you also talked about healthy, dignified communities. What does human communities, what, is, what does that mean around this sort of conservation? Oh, I don't know. How many of you grew up in really small c rural communities? <laughs> Not that many. Okay. So, <clears throat> in most places, kids have to leave when they finish their high school studies or, in some cases, the eighth grade and go find a job someplace else. Where we work, they tend to be the ice, as you can see by the map, from half an hour ago, these are pretty is excuse me. <clears throat> these are pretty isolated places. Thank you. <coughs> They're sort of forgotten communities, and uh, which is a story told around the world. But as you have visited, I'm sure whether it's in Africa or the United States and other countries, that it's really possible that surrounding communities build themselves up, see pride in their territory, and people are visiting, and they take, they show value for their property, uh, territories, which they themselves had, had lost over the several decades. And... Uh, it's just that tourism, it's not a silver bullet, but it can participate in stabilizing local economies long term. Um, you talked about marine parks. I'm a diver, I've been in some. Can you explain what does it mean if it is a marine park? In our case, marine parks are no take zones. So, You've heard about marine protected areas all around the world, I'm sure, but the vast majority of them are MPAs, marine protected areas. And what that means is that there is a productive side of these areas and they can vary and they're very hard to protect. Two years ago, two and a half years ago, I decided that I wanted to become involved in marine protected areas marine conservation and there was nothing in Argentina which is a vast coastline has a lot of marine territory so I decided we should go for the first no take zones and no take meaning no fishing no, no take meaning you can cross it but you can't take anything out of it so it, it's out it falls outside of production so it's a long story, I won't bore you with it, but what we ended up was 100,000 square kilometers of no-take zone down between the Falkland Islands and the Argentine coast, which is some of the rich richest areas around. Um, and you have to... So that this, was our This has to be a partnership foray. with the government, right? This is a government agreeing with you. That's not like you can acquire this land. Uh, no, and that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because so often these parks and this work are sort of the Doug and Chris show, and that is absolutely not the case because you can't create 13 national parks without the government being a partner in them. And you can't create these big marine parks without the government, the national government, saying, yes, okay, good idea. So these are really public, private. At the point of, the don of accepting our offer to donate all these parks with their infrastructure and so on, the government joins you as a partner. And it's the one that you saw... <clears throat> in the little video is the biggest one in history, but that is a, always a, with the government at your side. We've worked with 10 different presidencies over our 25 years. It, it, it is the largest public-private national park donation in history, um, it, which is an area larger than Switzerland. Uh, that was the last one, yeah. That was the last one. Um, uh, 
I want to zoom out for a minute from what specifically you're working on to your, your perspective on what will the world look like at the end of the century? Um, and, you know, in terms of, of what should we be doing now, if we, if we sort of take that step, which I've heard you talk about before, of saying, where, what are we going to look at, and therefore, what should we be worried about? Oh. Hmm. Honestly, yeah. I think that what the brilliance is of the kids going out on Fridays and marching is that you can't imagine a moment when, when the military or police will get in front of them and point guns at them. That's brilliant. That's genius. But it's also the biggest activist movement that I've seen since the 1960s and early 70s. I find that extraordinary. And I realize it's a long road, and who knows how long all of us will be able to keep up this pressure. But I, I, I think that... I think it's true that... Those kids look at me and say, Bertie, you're going to die of old age. I'm going to die of climate change. And I think, I think that's, that's true. I think if we don't change some things quickly and deeply, then we're going to see strife in the human and the non-human world that, that we're starting to see already. If you live in the Subsa Hall or you're, you're down in the Southern Pacific someplace, that's happening. So personally, I think that humans change in the face of crisis. And until there is crisis, and the crisis won't be one giant moment, it is, it is now. Nat Geo interviewed 1,500 people in the Carolinas two and a half years ago. Do you believe in climate change? 17% said yes. They did the same question. They asked the same question with the same people recently, two years later, and 37% of the people said yes. So these things are shifting, and there are tipping points out there in social, cultural movements that are very hard to see in the moment, but they're happening. And I think this one will happen, ironically, very fast. It feels very slow, but I think that, that uh, we'll see what happens in Santiago in December, but yeah, I don't know. It's a law, it's a big question. Uh, I think one of the questions that you're most frequently asked is, what what could what can I do? What can each of us sitting here do? You know, we can. What what should we be act, asking for? When you talk about activism, what is if there were one thing that you wish everybody in this room would really be, uh, you know, contacting their their representatives for? What would it be? I don't think there's one thing. I don't think there's 100 things. First and foremost, everybody should get out of bed every day and do something that has nothing to do with yourself. That is the baseline. If you think at all about what's taking place in terms of climate shifts and these giant glaciers fracturing down their middles and all these other things that seem so far away. They seem so um, avoidable if you're smart, if you're rich. But that's not the way it's going to go down. So people have to get out of bed and you have to act. And if you don't know what to do, you have to ask. What do you care about? Make a list. But do something and say something. The loudest voice of all is silence. Mm. And can you imagine looking at yourselves in the morning in the mirror and saying, 
things seem fine to me. Things are going, everything is swell. It's just not true. And if you don't, in our immediate lives, we're probably okay. But what does it mean to be civil? What is it? What is the what does it civility even mean? It means that I I care, or I should care about every one of you. How's it going? How are your families? What are you doing with your lives? A civil society, just that, requires so much more from us than what we have been giving in the last several decades. And that, I don't, I don't feel like I'm going back to the cave if I'm lurk looking and searching for civility in its true form. I'm looking for people who want to do something. And those that don't, I think you're going to be in the caboose at the back of the train. That's what I think. That, that is the kick in the butt, I think, that a lot of us need. Um, so you're saying that we all need to act in a way that reflects our values. And the first step of that is getting out of bed and, and doing something and acting and talking about it. Um, what is there, and I'm, I'm sorry, I know you're saying that the whole thing is a problem, but is there one particular area that most concerns you? Is it is it energy use? Is it agriculture? Is it construction? Is it population levels? Is it plastics? What is, what is, is there one particular area that, that concerns you the most, or is it really the overall ecosystem? I had a private conversation with Pope Francis a year ago in his office, in his library in the Vatican. He kind of asked me the same thing. And this is how I see it. You have a rising human population curve. You have a rising consumption curve. And you have a falling production of natural resources. So it's math. It's really just mathematics, if you want to be really cold about it. It's never, crisis is never one thing. I do think that our human population numbers are completely off the charts. Nobody questions 10 billion people anymore. It's just going to happen, so we've got to feed them, da, da 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 But all of us have to care about that. And every nation has to figure out for themselves how they choose to do that. This is not some, some system that overlays local culture and so on, but the, the recognition that there are limits to everything. If I have a tiny yard and I have two cows, it's probably one and a half cows too many. There are limits to everything. And this is the problem with public corporations, though God knows we've all benefited from them. But there are, there are really deep systemic problems that we face <clears throat> that, again, I guess I've come back to the same thing, that crisis will force us to change regulations, to change how we look at uh, the way we do business, the, the size of our families, the, the need to have the stuff we have in our houses. Uh, God, I hate to end on such a down. I'm gonna no, no we're gonna we're gonna open it up to, to questions, so we're not ending it on such. You have a microphone. I have somebody with a microphone Good here. Money. There's a question up front. Oh. oh, can you can you hear me? Great, thank you. Um, there's many categories in my life. I want to thank you from as a mother, as an organic farmer, as a storyteller. Um, two questions. Answer either or both. I'll be happy for either. Um, who or what are your biggest amplifiers of what you're trying to do in the world, or partners, or what's the biggest roadblock? Thank you. <clears throat> That's a good question. The big government, 
uh, the, the roadblock to what we're trying to do? <clears throat> you know how people say, I don't know what I'd do if someone gave me a billion dollars? I always know exactly <laughs> <laughs> what I'd do if you gave me a hundred billion dollars. We would, we know exactly how we would invest that. <clears throat> so I would say for all conservationists, given the opportunities out there in terms of doing large-scale conservation and rewilding, bringing back extirpated species. So I would say funding, and I would say this for everybody. And what was the first one? Amplifiers. Good question. Um, things like today. And really, each one of you becomes a megaphone, not for us, but for all life. Civility. Live those things as if your life depends on it, because it does. <laughs> Great question. Thank you. There was another question over here. Hi. Um, don't you think, or do you think, I suppose, that a lot of the attention when it comes to public discourse about climate change is placed on individual actions and things like ride the subway or paper straws or whatnot, when in fact there are things that we all structurally need to do, like have a smartphone and use electronic devices and ride the subway that's not very energy efficient. Um, so there are things that we can't really do much about that are bigger than us, that are structural, but then again, a lot of the attention uh, is about things that we as individuals should do. So how do we impact change? How do we get our government to use electric trains? How do we get corporates to pollute less? Because individuals aren't the biggest polluters, organizations are. That's a really good question. I think one of the, if I, if I can help you with this, is, is an area that we've been thinking about. We actually dove into this a little bit in the ideas section of the globe this past Sunday, is that w your pair of jeans could have taken 2,500 gallons of water to produce, but we don't know that, right? And so I think one of the first steps is, is how do we find these things out? And, and, and if, you're, if there are ways that we can measure what you know the impact is of buying this bottle, and you can't shop your way to a good environment, basically. But we can hold, um, we we can ask and measure companies based on how they are right now. They're not being measured on that. They're being measured on their price, um, and so finding ways that we can actually, you know, ask our corporations what it is, what the impact is. I think is one way. Yeah, I think you have to look at. Uh, of course, we're all. We've been born into a specific era, and nobody is guilt-free here. Certainly, I'm not. But just, you, just look at yourself as an activist, as Alice Waters, great chef, really changed the direction of um, cooking. She always says, your politics start at the kitchen table. So think about that in everything you do. Keep it really simple. Of course, we're part of this milieu. You, can't, you can run off and live in a cave, but we're not going to do that. So break your life down. Break it down and figure out, start using yourself as your best self and see what happens. That's a good point. There, there's another question or in the back or over there. Hi. Um, I, you mentioned rewilding, and I actually really like that term. Um, it's pretty awesome, just given there's a lot of conservation groups out there, and, and I haven't heard that a lot. What's been your best success story um, in any of your parks with rewilding? Great. Can you ask me that in February? Oh, boy, <clears throat> the rewilding business is tough. You have days of unbelievable joy with giant anteaters and pumas and uh, the 10 different species we work with. But if somebody dies, it, it, we also have 
not a lot of them, but some pretty tragic days as well. We have the two grandparents of our Jaguar program here sitting in the front row, and they can tell you that we have, as an example, <clears throat> Jaguars have been extirpated from this two million acre wetlands since the 1930s. So bringing them back, it, it sounded a lot easier than in fact it is. It's a top predator, it's quite complex. But it is, I would say, in many ways, the most rewarding thing we've done to reimagine we thought we were building national parks, and then we realized what we were doing is just creating national parks as a strategy for what we really wanted to do, which was fight the extinction crisis. So I think these guys and our teams would, would say that it's probably the most difficult work we've done, <clears throat> but it's the most satisfying, technically complex, but we have several species that are back after 70 years missing, and we have red-shouldered macaws flying in the same park, been gone over 100 years. So that is to start looking at territories in their full selves, and that's something. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to take the last question, and it's that uh, you and I were talking backstage about what you are most excited about going forward, sort of your, your biggest source of optimism. Well, rewilding's one of them. That's definitely true. But I also think now that we have these parks behind us and we have a lot of post-donation properties or projects with forest here and others. Um, we have already started to work on new marine territories and land-based projects, but really changing our, our strategies to look for territories that are partially terrestrial and then going from zero to 12 miles out on the whole coastlines and working at this extraordinary place on the map where the Pacific Ocean comes down and meets the Atlantic Ocean with the uplift from Antarctica. And then things get really interesting, and that's where we're working, one of the places we're working now. That is extraordinary. Thank you for what you are doing. Uh, thank you for inspiring all of us today. Chris, you should check out the, her foundation website. It has a ton of information and great photos on there. She's also published a book. Uh, that is just beautiful and just sort of all also captures your movement. Thank you for sharing your message and telling us all to get out of bed and, uh, and, and start acting. Oh, thank you very much, everyone. Sorry about my voice. <laughs>